music do you play? I play most types of music. Uh, you know, rock and roll uh, being probably the, the biggest influence. Rockabilly, of course, blues. Some classical, you know, I do a lot of finger style stuff, uh, all of Chet Atkins and uh, kind of a mixture between Jet, Chet Atkins and Jeff Beck and B.B. King and, <laughs> you know, a lot, a lot of different styles. Yeah. Nice. Um, so you are a part of a band now or how does that work right now? I have several bands. Um, I have bands in uh, England and Sweden and California and Nashville. So how did that happen? Uh, you start with one, or how did that happen? Well, I, I lived in California all my life, so I, I you know, I, I know thousands of musicians out there, and have had shows in operation <clears throat> most of my life on some level. So anything from a trio on up to eight or ten pieces is not uncommon. Mm, wow! And then when I tour Europe, you know, I've put together bands for those tours and so all those guys are there and same thing in sweden and and uh, all, all over europe you know we tour all over there and uh since i've lived in nashville i've i've, I've uh, put bands together here too that's awesome i do a, a lot of solo stuff uh, some duo stuff trios quartets five piece eight piece ten piece just depends on what the budget is you know <clears throat> so you toured around like the world kind of yes mm -hmm. so how, how did that whole thing happen did you just decide like that you wanted to tour or how how did that happen well i i uh i've been in you know some famous bands and you know worked with a lot of famous people and uh endorsed a lot of products through my life i ibanez sent me to japan in uh in 79 you know i, I toured over there with uh, alfonso johnson and uh um, what was his name? The drummer. Um, oh, it's escaping me right now. Uh, <laughs> hilarious guy. Uh, I'd have to look it up to, to remember what it, what his name was. But uh, they uh, they sent me uh, on tour all, all over Europe. Yeah, along with Billy Cobham and Alfonso Johnson, and uh, eventually, uh, you know, well, they introduced me to Bob Weir, and I started working with Bob Weir from The Grateful Dead. And, um, and then we toured over there and, and, uh, I started spending more, more and more time there. I, I uh, was invited over to, uh, England to play a, uh, an Eddie Cochran festival. And, uh, <clears throat> a fella met me while I was there and decided that he wanted to fund having me come over there every year for the next 10 years. And I said, well, you'll need to find me a band and uh, some gigs. And, uh, so he did. And, uh, the band he found was Albert Lee and Hogan's Heroes, and uh, the bass player from that band uh, li liked the, the material he heard and wanted to put a band together for me. And uh, and after he played with me, he uh, he said, "Where where have you been hiding? <laughs> Why haven't I known about you?" And uh, he said, "I met Albert uh, 14 years ago, and we've been touring all over Europe. And Albert at the time was playing with the Rhythm Kings with Bill Wyman's band and uh, backing up the Crickets." And the Everly Brothers sometimes, and uh, the bass player, Brian Hodgson, uh, from his band, said, if you'd be interested, I could plug you into all the promoters we use with Albert, and, um, uh, you know, so he did, and he opened up all of, all of Europe for me. Wow. And, um, yeah. So, was... when you guys do uh, live shows, is it, uh, I've seen a few different uh, live uh, performances of yours, and I see you go with uh, Summertime Blues and then La Bamba. Um, what else usually do you guys play? Because uh, I've seen those two. Well, it, it just depends on the gig. You know, I've headlined blues tours. I've headlined rockabilly tours. I've headlined rock and roll tours. Uh, I've got a lot of original music. Um, I, I've got a lot of music by other people that I've, you know, sort of developed my take on it. And, uh, of course, uh, a lot of Eddie's. Um, I, I, I generally will do 20 flight rock something else which my dad wrote with uh, Sharon Sheely uh, I was pleased to do Three Steps to Heaven with the uh, Crickets at a Cochran Festival uh, Sonny and, and the guys or, or some, some of the guys played on that last session that Eddie did on Three Steps to Heaven 
And so mm -hmm. to uh, revisit some of that with them. And, and uh, it really just depends on, on the gig. You know, I have a whole, uh, whole array of songs that I've done most of my career and uh, originals uh, that come up. I, I wrote a tune when I was over in Sweden and uh, um, Brian uh, co-wrote on it with me and he presented it to Albert and Albert decided to do the song. And then the uh, producer called me and said, Bobby, could I send all the uh, tracks for the demo over? Because, you know, some of Albert's band had already played on the demo. And uh, when he got the got the tracks, he heard my singing and my, my guitar playing on it. And he said, God, that's a hell of a guitar solo you put on that. He says, I'm going to ask Albert to keep it on his record. And he did. He kept my solo on the record. And of course, there was lots of room for him to play, too. So. Uh, you know, I, I wrote the song purposely uh, for guitar players, you know, to to do a lot of hot rod on it, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so I've I've seen like on like Spotify and stuff, I've seen uh, a few songs like um the Goodbye Lorraine and um, Don't Think Twice. Was that specifically you, or was that like a group of people? Because I see like a few headliners, you know. That that was my band. We were on tour over in Sweden, and the promoter liked to put compilation albums together, and and he used uh, he used my track on on uh, on that uh, Bob Dylan tune, along with a, other American artists. So I was one of a compilation of many artists. I see. Unfortunately, when they mixed it. I had sent the effects channel too, but they. They didn't uh, uh, use the effects channel gently uh, as it was intended. They had it turned all the way up, like, and, and it was, you know, no, nothing like what I would have wanted. But uh, that's just a different in a difference in um, perception, you know. I guess if I'd have been involved with the uh, production of the final product, I could have uh, controlled that for him, or just sent him a final mix. You know, I, I would have preferred to have done that. Um, goodbye, Lorraine. You know, we were on tour. Every every time we toured over there, the uh, promoter would take us in the studio and try and get us to record something for somebody. And uh, in addition to that, we'd record something of our own. You know, so uh, I think uh, I think I wrote that song. Uh, now that I think of it, and um, yeah, he he he'd all, often just want me to write something. You know, and and uh, we'd be in the studio and just include it with what we were doing. You know. Mm. Makes sense. So, um, uh, sorry. Uh, so with, um, the different songs that you guys have, I guess, done or toured around, um, do you have a specific favorite of, I guess, Eddie's? You know, I, I like all, all of it material for the most part. There are songs I never that fond of, but, uh, for the most part, I just love Eddie's material and uh, uh, ate up pretty much everything I ever could get of it. Um, I helped uh, Rockstar Records to uh, understand that there were tracks out there that nobody knew about because I had heard them when I was young. And um, he was able to find most of those tracks, including the tracks that Eddie produced on my mom. My mom would have been tickled pink to, to be on a CD with Eddie. She was a great singer, and uh, Eddie produced her uh, with the intention of uh, seeing if there was interest in, you know, having another Julie London type artist. Mm -hmm. My mom was a very good singer and uh, introduced me to a lot of variety of music. She was into jazz and blues and uh, stuff on a on a pretty pretty big scale. She was a trained opera singer. Uh, when she was 16, they touted her as being the next Lily Pons because she uh, had a range that was a little bit higher than Lily Pons, and of course, is what Lily was famous for. Wow. And uh, what about your dad? My dad was a great, uh, great songwriter. Um, he, he wrote uh, Three Steps to Heaven with Eddie and uh, co wrote some, something else with Sharon. Um, I finished some of the songs that he had started. Um, I've still got more songs that he had started that I'm going to finish. And, uh, he was a very talented, smart, smart fellow. Uh, he, he had a terrible problem with alcoholism and, uh, he really just let that kill him. You know, he died when he was 50 years old from alcoholism, basically. Wow. And, uh, it's, that's part of why I never drank and never did drugs. You know, I just didn't want anything to do with it. 
messing my life up the way it messed his life up and my mom's life. You know, it, uh, it was a terrible way to grow up in a family with an alcoholic uh, in charge of <laughs> working and feeding you, you know, and we went hungry a lot, you know. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. So, well, after Eddie died, how did that, how did the whole family, I guess, react well, that, in my opinion, that pretty much destroyed the family. The way they, the way they dealt with uh, the loss of that, so unhealthy. Um, going and visiting Granny was uh, kind of a combination of terrible and and beautiful, you know. And uh, I loved her, and uh, but life was so focused around Eddie that it was just unhealthy, you know. It, the house was dark, and uh, um, it just was. Uh, it was a terrible loss, you know. My my dad is one of the people that identified Eddie's body when they flew it over here before the funeral, and uh, I I don't think that memory ever left him uh, with anything good. You know, he he it was just a horrible experience for him, and uh, his drinking, from my experience. I, of course, I was older uh, after that, and uh, it just got worse and worse and worse, you know. And, and uh, the the family had a history of alcoholism, and and uh, it's a shame uh, that it was affecting Eddie al already at twenty one, you know. And uh, Eddie had some uh, some difficulties when he was on tour, and you know, I, I told a, a lot of the stories in my in my book. Um, I, I talk about Eddie's life uh, really through my eyes, you know, and, and uh, the similarities of our lives and uh, the paths that we were on. And, uh, you know, since Eddie was my uncle and, and uh, I, I started playing so young, uh, I was friends with a lot of Eddie's friends. And uh, I got to know Eddie not only from from my relationship with them, I actually worked with Jerry Capehart longer than Eddie did. Wow. And, uh, you know, there was probably no other person around Eddie Moore during those critical years of his career than Jerry Capehart. He was around him certainly more than the family was. And uh, he was around him in those circumstances where Eddie was actually doing his career. And so he, uh, he saw a lot of the good and a lot of the bad and uh, was actually, uh, you know, just part of the... Uh, part of that dynamic and uh, I learned a lot about my family uh, through Jerry too because he uh, he uh, found himself dealing with some of the the problems that were going to rear their ugly heads uh, later after Eddie's death because uh, decisions they made I think were not good for him you know they they were fooled by people that wanted to fool them and uh, it's, it's a shame that um they uh, sometimes let pride get in the way of good judgment. And uh, one time uh, they sent me a, a manila envelope and uh, scrawled on it was Bobby signed this, you know, and underlined. And it was uh, a contract for some uh, for a song. And, um, it said, for valuable consideration, you sign over all these rights for perpetuity the consideration was a dollar <laughs> and uh, I, I called up Gloria and, and uh, Eddie's older sister who was kind of in charge of things over at granny's house. And I said, did you sign this? And she said, we certainly did. I said, do you have an attorney? She said, we certainly do. I said, who is it? You know, I'm in the business. I know a lot of attorneys and, and uh, know a lot of names. And uh, she said, well, the publishing company provides us with one. And I said, well, do you understand that's like putting the fox in the hen house uh, to guard the chickens? I, I said, you need, a, you need an attorney that's protecting your rights, not, not uh, working for the publishing company. <laughs> yeah. they, they had signed some terrible contracts, just some terrible, terrible contracts. And uh, it's heartbreaking, you know, uh, the greed and the, 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 the fear, the... Uh, pretending like you know something when you just don't, you know, and, and um, 
it, it, it's not anything Eddie would have been happy about. Um, Eddie, Eddie, uh, dying at 21 was, was still a, a very young man, you know, and very inexperienced about some of the things about the business, you know, and, and, uh, by the time I met Jerry, I, I'd had a very long, successful career, you know, and, uh, as an adult, you know, for many, 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 many years, you know, uh, certainly longer than Eddie played in his entire career, you know, and, and, um, had a lot of record deals and a lot of, a lot of things to, uh, learn from that Eddie, Eddie, Eddie never went through, you know, and, and of course, Jerry was doing the best he could at the time, but Jerry was, uh, afraid of people finding out that he didn't know everything. You know, and, and his defense for that was to act like he knew about everything. And if, if you were smart, you'd find out, well, that maybe Jerry wasn't right about something he thought he knew or wanted you to think he knew, you know. And now that, that was a that was a problem during Eddie's career and a problem with my career with him. And uh, I love Jerry. He was a brilliant, a brilliant guy. Um, very, very, very uh, astute songwriter and a production guy. His biggest weakness was just the, his insecurity, and we all we all go through that to some degree. And um, you know, I think Jerry could have uh, had a lot more success had he lived. He wound up dying from a brain tumor, a cancerous brain tumor, and uh, boy, he died very suddenly. How old? I don't remember how old he was. It was in uh, ninety. I think it was ninety eight. Hmm. Wow. You could look that up, but uh, we well, have um, a long relationship. Yeah. Um, was he also close with the family? So was there like any? The family had a lot of bad things to say about Jerry through, through, throughout history. And uh, some of it rightfully so, and some of it was just simply ignorance. Mm. Um, you know, the family acts like they know me. They don't know me. Um, in my life, my grandmother saw me play at two performances, two. Wow. The first gig I ever played, it was a talent show at school. The second gig was with Steppenwolf at, uh, uh, I think, it, I think it was at UCLA Royce Hall or something like that. She'd seen me play at home. You know, I used to play for at home. Usually would wind up crying because it was a very tender thing, you know, to do, uh, some Eddie songs for her, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, it, it was very personal to me and uh, I didn't tell people about it, but uh, Eddie started visiting me in uh, lucid dreams as soon as I started playing. And in those dreams, he'd teach me to play and teach me about life and teach me about him. And um, although it, it, uh, it could have just been dreams <clears throat> or it could have been something uh, that he was involved with. I don't have any way of knowing how to how to calculate which which was true, but it certainly seemed real more real than life to me. And uh, the guitar just, in many ways, unfolded for me. Uh, it was as though I already knew stuff. And um, I practiced a lot. You know, I four four to twelve hours was not uncommon for me to practice for many times during my life. And um, I remember one time I was doing a session for uh, Kim Carnes and her husband. I used to do uh, a lot of recording for them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I can't keep this me centered in the in the camera. Uh, but uh, one time I was doing a session for Kim and 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 uh, her husband and uh, Baker Knight came to visit. And Baker was a famous songwriter. He wrote a lot of hits for Ricky Nelson, and he and Eddie were friends. And I was out in the uh, in the studio, uh, not in the booth. I was just practicing in between takes, noodling around. And Baker came out to watch me. They were pointing out at me and talking about something. And so he came out to watch me. And uh, he said, "God, I've only, I only know one person that played that those chords that way." And I said, "Who was that?" And he said, "Eddie Cochran." And I said, "Oh, Eddie was my uncle." And he about passed out. He turned white as a sheet. Wow. And. Uh, you know, pe people uh, all my life saw similarities between Eddie and I. Um, and it was a little bit uncomfortable for me. So I, I, I never told people. 
that I had all those uh, visitations and, and those lucid dreams because people were already whispering that it was like Eddie had been reincarnated in me somehow. And I, you know, although I, I loved Eddie immensely and, and he, he was my, my biggest idol on guitar and singing. Uh, and and uh, I just uh, wanted to be my own guitar player too. You know, I, I, I started playing sessions when I was 14. My dad had a recording studio and if people didn't have a guitar player, I was the guy in town, you know, I was, I was there, you know, and so I, mm -hmm. I play on a lot of different records and, and uh, I got a lot of pressure to play like Eddie did uh, at times when I, when I wanted to play something different, you know, and, and I liked a lot of artists like James Burton and BB King and uh, Jackie DeShannon turned me on to BB King when I was 14 said, your uncle was a huge fan of this guy, you know, listen to him. And, uh, and I did. And, Jackie taught me some stuff on guitar that I still use today. And um, I uh, I had very, very broad influences. I, of course, I knew Eddie was very much into uh, Chet Atkins. And so I uh, I got into Chet Atkins big time when I was young and, and uh, learned learned a lot of stuff he did. And uh, I always played by ear, um, which is a, a good way to play helps you when you're picking things off records uh, it helps you to be able to listen yeah and uh you know so i got really good at that i got good at wearing out grooves on a record just popping the needle down at the right spot over and over and over and uh <clears throat> it's a lot different than today where you can slow things down uh, however much you want and keep them in the same key and you know you've got tablature and, and stuff that show you how something is played exactly you know exactly where it's played and with what fingers and how to pick it and you got videos all over the internet it's it's a different world you know mm -hmm. but it leaves a lot of musicians wanting as far as their ability to listen and uh you know that was something i was uh, gifted with was uh you know i made a lot of a lot of my living through the years by being a critical listener you know and helping companies develop guitars and amps and pickups and strings and speakers and, you know, effects, all the different things and being able to critically listen and, and uh, be truthful about it, you know, and, and uh, there are a lot of people that say they can hear things that, you know, when I test them, they can't hear those things. And, um, you know, I've been in a position to test a lot of people and, 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 uh, Although I have a lot of hearing damage from all the years of playing and having an amp blasting at my head, I still have critical, critical listening skills that uh, other people don't have. Even though there are some frequencies I can't hear, there's a lot of stuff I can hear that other people don't. And that's just because of a lot of, a lot of training, you know, and, and um, the kind of people I hung out with. And um, I, I, throughout my career, I'd find some genius that knew, knew about electronics or speakers or amps, and I would be their guinea pig, you know, to test ideas out on and, and uh, hopefully come up with something that I liked and that they liked and improve their products, you know. And I started testing for Fender when I was 15. Really? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a lot. So you, wow, that's kind of crazy. Um so your hearing isn't as good as it used to be because of that, huh? Well, I, you know, I, I played clubs, you know, five, six, seven nights a week, you know, for many years and, and uh, toured all my life, you know, and, and uh, you know, li listening to s sound levels that, you know, mo most people don't know what it sounds like to have 20,000 people scream at you mm -hmm. and your ears just crackle with the, with the distortion Wow. From how loud that is. I mean, it's louder than the jet plane, you know, it's, it's a, it's a roar that's just simply unbelievable, you know, and uh, playing as loud as we played, you know, full blast on state, big stages, little stages, you know, <laughs> and uh, night after night after night in the clubs, you know, I have my amp tilted back right at me, you know, mm. 40 watt amp as loud as it'd go. And, 100 watt amp as loud as it to go, you know? Yeah. So I, I know I had hearing damage. I had a girlfriend when I was 18 and uh, she tested my ears and said, whoa, you got a lot of hearing loss in this ear. That's where my amp was, was on that side. And um, 
but like I said, I can, I can, uh, I can hear things that other people can't hear. I, I used to do a lot of uh, loading of my ammunition. I, I was into shooting and, uh, I could load about 300 rounds an hour. And one time I ran out of powder and I didn't realize it. And I had a box full of shells <laughs> and I didn't know which ones had powder and which ones didn't, but I could shake them. I couldn't hear it in this ear, but I could hear it in this ear. I could hear the, the powder shake. And uh, I could hear the when there was no powder, apparently, you know. So I, I found all the ones that, that had powder versus the ones that didn't have powder and, and reloaded those, pulled the bullets. And I made a mistake on a few shells, but, uh, you know, it was pretty clear that I could hear them over here, but I couldn't hear them over here, you know. And um, I still have trouble hearing people speak because it's it's in those sibilance ranges where the s and the the difference between a, a D and a B and a M and an N and an F, you know, um, F versus S, you know, you it's can't hear this. It's S sounds like F. <laughs> yeah. Wild. So, um, well, hearing is one thing, but what about sight? Is did anything happen with like the stages, lights? I don't know. No, that that's that's that stuff's all pretty normal. I, I had great eyesight and I was about uh 40, 45 or fifty and uh eventually I had to have cataract surgery because uh I had uh, an illness several years before that caused cataracts mm -hmm. and uh, it caused premature cataracts. So they replaced my uh lenses basically uh with with uh, artificial lenses. So I can't I can't adjust my vision uh, for close up and far away, but I have uh, in one eye I have twenty twenty, and the other I think I have twenty fifteen, uh, which is excellent, you know. Yeah. And uh, there are some uh, some artifacts, you know, just from aging, you know, that you get, you know, little floaters and stuff like that that show up every now and then that aren't aren't necessarily a big deal, but. Um, I also do a lot of uh, healing of type of thinking. You know, I, I have a book coming out about language, love, relationship, and spirituality. And uh, in the book, I talk about how we use a lot of words unconsciously mm -hmm. and uh, subconsciously that has an effect on, on how the world turns out when we, when we're speaking about our life and thinking about our life, we use language mostly. And uh, in order to describe a picture or a movie you see, you do it with language. Language, And um, when we're speaking, a lot of times we use words that if we really thought about it, we wouldn't use that word. You know, the, the word but, you know, uh, I love you, but whatever sounds uh, to the person who's listening like maybe you don't love them yeah the word but rules out what you just said mm -hmm. but people don't use it like that they talk about something they love and they say but which rules out that they love something and then they talk about some other thing um that may also be true but the fact that they've ruled out the important part of the conversation which was what the, it started with um is catastrophic in communication definitely you know if you tell your wife i love you but what she might think is to what degree don't you love me for whatever you know and that's not what was intended you know so people use language in my opinion frivolously i go into much deeper explanations uh, about it in the book um i was explaining that to a uh, uh an eight-year-old and her mother and the eight-year-old, as soon as I explained that, she said, uh, God, I could, the, the idea was I want to go to the beach, but I have to go to work. Mm -hmm. So the idea that they wanted to go to the beach was ruled out in language with the word, but. So the little girl says, God, I could do my homework at the beach. I didn't think of that before. You know, when you don't rule it out, I, I want to go to the beach and I have to go to work. Now you think about, oh, what could I do to still go to the beach instead of ruling it out and just going to work, you know? Right. 
And um, it's a very simple uh, lesson uh, or observation. And also uh, people use a lot of words like I have to do this, I got to do that. I must do something. I, I need to do something. I should do something. People are always telling people as they're growing up, you should be doing this. You should be doing that. When in fact, they're doing something else, you know. Um, all those words are disempowering on a certain level, possibly. And what I teach is that if there's something that's important for you to do and you find yourself I have saying I have to do it, that's like putting blinders on so you can't see it. Mm -hmm. And when the course correction comes, since you decided that the course you were going to take has to be this or must be that or should be this or needs to be that, um, those blinders keep you from seeing the course correction that shows up. And people often wind up at a destination they didn't intend and they wonder how they got there. Well, my proposition is they got there through language and through words and through ideas which sprung forth because of the language and the words they were using. So if, if, if uh, let, let's say that uh, you got, you got to go to work. Well, if you, if you want to, if you want to make a living, yeah, yeah maybe you do got to go to work, so to speak, or you have to. Um, however, when you go to work with an, I, an attitude of, I got to do it, I need to do it, I have to do it. You can be resentful about having to do it and not respectful and grateful as it would be if you were saying, I get to go to work. Yeah. That's a privilege. Mm -hmm. Having to is not a privilege. It's not, it's, it, in fact, you don't have a choice if you have to. Yeah. And all really, when you think about it, it, it's, it really does matter what we're saying because it kind of changes the way we even think about it. Yes, uh, and in the Bible, it talks about that God created all of this with a word. He brought it into being with a word. Let there be whatever, you know. Right. And and um, whether you believe in that, it, it still is an, uh, a, an important observation that words are important. And when we're listening to somebody, we listen through a perspective that includes the cliches that we have added into our language. And when we listen to somebody, we interpret what they're saying often by adding meanings that weren't there by saying a cliche instead of the actual words they used. And so if you ever played the game of telephone where you whisper in the first person's ear, then they whisper in someone's ear and then they whisper in someone's ear. By the time you go through 12 people's listening, you can't even recognize what was first said. Right. And that's yeah. one of the problems with the Bible, for instance, that's one of the problems with oral history is people add their perception to the oral history, which changes the oral history. And when you go through generations and, and centuries of changes, well, that's not the same thing as what happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, there are books out now explaining how the, the worst eyewitness is an, an, an actual eyewitness sometimes because they see it through the filter of their perception. And sometimes they see a black guy when it was a white guy or a white guy when it was a black guy. And uh, you, you see regularly people that were uh, found guilty and, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years later, they find out because we have DNA now uh, that can be evaluated that, that the person was never guilty. But the eyewitness and the prosecutor and people's perception uh, causes things to not be the way it actually was. And, um, that's a lot of what my book is about, you know, and, and uh, when you're in the process of healing, it's important that you pay attention to what you say. You know, someone says, God, my foot's killing me. Well, is that is that the result you want, that you're going to die because you have a foot ache? Um, this situation that broke my heart is killing me. Is that really what you want? I understand that you're heart, heartbroken, your, your, your anguish is deep state that not that it's killing you because you may bring on a result that you didn't intend. Like I said, we wind up at a destination that we never intended and we didn't know how we got there because we were frivolous with our language, frivolous with our perspective, our perspective, frivolous with our perceptions. So rather than listening to a person and, and repeating what they actually say, we repeat what we think they meant. And if you ask a person, 
what did I just say? When they repeat it back to you, they will almost always not get it right because they listen through a perception. That's, that's crazy. That's yeah. the way life is. And, and we wonder why life is as messed up as it is. Well, it's because we've got a lot of people running around speaking in a way that isn't in alignment with, with their authentic purpose in communication. They use cliches instead of saying what actually happened. Um, I, I had a, a friend I was uh, life coaching and, and she said uh, her relationship with her husband annihilated her. I said, well, you look pretty good to me for being annihilated. Beautiful woman. I said, well, let's look up annihilated and see what it means. And it pretty much is completely destroyed. And that's not true hardly ever. You might be incredibly hurt and sad. Um, you know, I was singing a, a song, Since I Fell for You by Lenny Welch one night. And it's like the light bulb came on. And what people usually say is the light bulb went off. Well, that's not what you mean. It's like you're in a dark room and the light comes on. It illuminates the room. It didn't go off. <laughs> hey. You're in the light and a light bulb goes off. What, what does that matter? You know, <laughs> what they meant that came on, you know. And uh, so I'm singing this song and it says, love, love brings such misery and pain. And I thought, that's not true. Love never brought misery and pain. Love is phenomenal always and forever. Every single time, love is great. It never brought misery and pain. That song, love hurts, love hurts, love hurts. They say it over and over in that song. Love doesn't hurt. Love is incredible. But they don't say that. I know what they mean. When you love deeply, you open yourself up to potential deep hurt by betrayal, by lies, by you know, those, those things hurt. Betrayal and lies hurt by abuse, uh, narcissism. You know, you can be hurt by a narcissist, not because they love you, but because they don't love you, because they don't have those those e e emotions. You know, they're all concerned about themselves. You know, it's, they invite you to their masturbation party and ask, how was it for you? And they don't even care. You know, <laughs> it's crazy. You know, that's that's bizarre. It. Makes me also think of like jobs like lawyers or doctors who specifically change what you're thinking, or that's what their whole position is. Their angle is to change your mind or your perceptive perception of whatever it was, you know, political people as well. It, it's kind of crazy when you think about it like that as well. Well, an attorney, one of, one of the amazing things about attorneys is they're very specific about their language. That's what a, a huge part of their training is, is to be very, very specific about the language. To say you may do something uh, me, means you, you can do it or not. To say you shall do something means you shall do it. Those yeah. two words are immensely different. And the misuse of those words could, could be catastrophic for you. And a doctor... They're trained the way they're trained. They're not trained about nutrition hardly at all. They know very little about nutrition. Even many nutritionists don't know the latest and greatest about a lot of nutritional ideas. And we have a medical world that's all based mostly on pharmaceutical promotion. The way a lot of uh, schools survive and the way a lot of doctors survive is by being supported by the pharmaceutical world. And so... When a person is taught to visualize healing to the tiniest, most 3D technicolor detail, that's very different than being told that you're going to die. Mm -hmm. They plant the seed that you're incurable and that you're going to die. And if you don't do what they say, you're going to die. And even if you do do what they say, you're going to die. That's what they told me. you got nine months to live. Get your papers in order because you will never improve. That's what they told me in 86. And I finally uh, realized that I didn't want to die. And that maybe my doctors were killing me. What I discovered is that if any doctor ever tells you that you're incurable or that you're uh, going to die, then you have the wrong doctor if you want to get well. Because all of their patients die in their experience with the condition they're dealing with. 
So if you come to somebody that says, well, yeah, the, the statistics are that you could die from this, you know, in a very, very short period of time. However, what I teach is miracles. I teach that we're all capable of creating miracles. You know, in the Bible, although I'm not religious anymore, I was taught that Christ was teaching us that anything he could do, we could do and more. That's essentially what he was saying in the Bible. Yet people pray. Uh, well, let, let me first add that Christ also said that the kingdom of God is within you. Everybody's looking out there. You're going to go to someplace. Heaven or hell, you're going to go to it. I'll tell you, I know a lot of people that are living in hell right here on earth. And I know a lot of people that live in heaven right here on earth. When you're making love to the woman that you that you uh, have, have just totally opened your heart to and vice versa, that's heaven. There, I, I don't know of anything any better than the birth of your child. You know, for most of us, there are some people that are just, you know, they're different. Narcissists, they don't have that empathy gene. It got yanked right out their butt, you know, pulled it out at birth. <laughs> and uh, we've got a whole country full of these powerful CEOs and government officials that they say there are the that are um, our leaders. They're not our leaders. They're supposed to be our representatives. And they're supposed to lead in representing us. That's not what any of them really do either on the left or the right. We've got a bunch of scoundrels willing to get away with what they can get away with at, at times. And, you know, it's interesting that oftentimes the Republican Party is not saying uh, what they're going to do for the, the poor people in the middle class and all that. They're, they're talking about protecting the interest of the wealthy. Whereas the Democrats are often talking about even though they don't follow through on a lot of it, helping the poor rise up to the middle class and the middle class rise up to the upper class. But we've, we've, uh, we've lost the course of direction to get there. You know, we, we no longer have a society based on a tax structure like we had with the uh, Eisenhower era, where the wealthy were taxed huge percentages once they got past a certain amount of wealth, we still had wealthy people, extremely wealthy people back then, but we built a middle class that had second homes and vacation homes, uh, could take vacations. And now they're still fighting about a $15 minimum wage. Uh, and, and I saw recently that uh, one of the representatives was, was talking about his 1970s job at middle wa middle uh, uh, minimum wage. And they said the minimum wage then brought up to now, uh, considering all the inflation, the way houses have increased, would be $25 an hour or thereabouts, as opposed to 15, which that won't happen until uh, 20, 2025. It's not even going to be right now. And I don't know anybody that can truly live on minimum wage right now or uh, at $15 an hour. $25 an hour is, is even difficult. Well, another thing actually is where you live. So, you know, in like California, yeah, it's a $15 an hour um, or places in like, I guess, what is there? Um, in different like states, it's cheaper. It's a lot less. Some places well, it's like well, $7 an hour. Cheaper to live here in Nashville. You know, oh, I, yeah. I see the differences. However, you, you suffer the weather and, and you suffer some of the ignorance of, uh, you know, people that just have not traveled much more than 100 miles away from their home all their lives. And you've got generation after generation of people like that mm -hmm. that uh, really are still living under the under the rule of superstition. You know, it's just like when you uh, um, visit a caveman, you know, uh, and they're still superstitious about darkness, you know, and, and uh, it's a, a different way of life. They have you know, every society, no matter where it is, has some kind of God and some kind of belief system of, of good and evil. And uh, uh, re religion uh, no longer has the place in society that it once had. It doesn't mean that it's right or wrong. It just doesn't have the power that it once had. 
uh, religion really at one point became more about money and greed and power as opposed to true salvation. And, uh, you know, I think um, uh, Gandhi uh, said it very wisely. He said, uh, the Christianity is a beautiful religion. I just don't many, meet many Christians that are Christ-like. You know, and, and uh, with, with Trump's uh, ban on, on Muslim people, you know, I, I've known Muslim people that are beautiful people, just incredible people. And it doesn't matter to me what religion they are. You know, when, when they honor the golden rule, which to me is a fundamental way of life. You know, it's uh, to a large degree what Christ was teaching. Um, when, when you teach love and openness and, and, and connection and empathy, life is, rewards you. It's, it's in so many ways, it's its own reward because it, it engenders a, a, a kindness in us. And um, so much of our language uh is used in a way that it disconnects us from what's actually important to us. If if I, I if I say I have to do this interview with you, well, I not, there's no, almost nothing I have to do. I have to breathe or I'll die. But my body takes care of that for me. You know, if I don't go in the bathroom and go to the bathroom, then I'm going to make a mess where I am. You know, but I don't have to. I can make a mess if I want. If I get to, it's a whole different world. That's a whole different world. If I get to have you as a, an interviewer as opposed to having to have you as an interviewer, it's a different world. I can come to something willingly and with openness and with a freedom that I don't know. You know, I've come to a point where when I use a, a, a word incorrectly, it, of, it often feels so different when I correct it. You know, like if I say, I like you as an, uh, an interviewer, but whatever, you know, like a anything after that. Or I like you as an interviewer and I can have the same comment, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I still get to like you as an interviewer. Yeah. As opposed to you feeling like subconsciously, even if it's not conscious, mm -hmm. like, well, what's wrong with me or what's wrong with the interview, you know, which was never intended. Right. You know, and, 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 and that's there everywhere in life, every single day, pay attention to how often you use the word, but, and think about whether the word and would be more appropriate or if the word, however, or in spite of, um, there are other ways to state it that are in alignment with how you feel. And there's not this subconscious conflict going on. And can you imagine how much conflict, inner conflict is going on and we're unaware of it? You know, we're completely unaware that we're unaware. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're really opening my eyes in a lot of different ways. You know, I've, I've never really thought of it like that when you, I guess, just English or just words. But it's, it's crazy, actually, just the way that we perceive things, just how someone else would say something. It's, that's crazy, just the thought. I I use a lot of this in my master classes and clinics. Um, I was doing a clinic down in, uh, or a master class down in Mexico. And at the, at the beginning of the thing, they were talking about, well, how do we advertise it? We only got a day or two to advertise it. And I said, let's do it as a master class on relationship. And, and during that master class, on relationship with guitar, if you bring your partner or a friend, they get in free. And at my master class, I had a psychiatrist that was 70 years old and retired. And she was, you know, interrupting with questions constantly, very interested in my ideas and uh, very much in agreement with, with me about uh, the, the things I was talking about. And she said, you now she kept talking. So I said, you and I, would do well to, to meet on another day where we have some hours to talk and share. So I met with her for about five or six hours on a following day. And she shared with me that her specialty was multiple personality people. And she said she discovered through blood tests that in one personality, they had a disease. And in the other personality, they didn't have the disease. 
And she took that to the board of people that govern that type of psychiatry, and they thought she was crazy. However, the head of the board said, well, I'm going to go test some of my patients. You know, you, you bring up some interesting things. And he came back, said, you're correct. I, I've proven what you've said. So imagine in a multiple personality person, they usually don't know about the other personality, right? Yeah. And then one personality, you've got a disease. And then the other one, your belief system alone causes you not to have the disease. Now, isn't that a miracle? Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Mind-blowing. And yet you haven't heard about that probably because you haven't heard about it. You know, the pharmaceutical companies have nothing to gain in their, in their, with their business structure, the way it is, they've got nothing to gain by really curing us. They have everything to gain by keeping us on their pharmaceutical products. And when people, uh, like the one that came up with the polio cure decide not to charge, uh, and not to patent their cure so they can make a profit on it. Mm -hmm. They do it out of the kindness of their heart. They share their gift with the world. Um, we all have uh, a necessity to have food and, and water, place to live, and a certain degree of comfort would be nice, you know. Um, however, our, our society is not structured in a way that it was a problem when Reagan closed all the nuts. All the crazy people that were housed in these places were put out on the street and our, our, our homeless population exploded during that era. And when the when I've got a friend who's got a 100% cure for PTSD, but the VA won't even listen to he and his partners to hear what they've discovered. When the VA is part of the lack of action about Agent Orange being a problem for all those troops that were subjected to Agent Orange. We have a new problem. All our troops that went to the Middle East in all those wars were subjected to depleted uranium poisoning. Depleted uranium is what was in those shells that penetrated that armor of uh, Saddam Hussein's huge army. You know, his military me mechanized force, his, all his tanks. So where do you think all the depleted uranium that wasn't used up in the explosion went. Well, it's just like this coronavirus. If I breathe out coronavirus, what happens to it in 10 minutes? It travels as far as it travels, be it six feet or 100 feet, depending on the wind. And then it falls to earth, just like gravity makes everything do. And who's talking about coronavirus on, on, the, on the floor? When? When do they ever talk to you about that? Everywhere you walk has coronavirus if there have been coronavirus people there. So it's on your shoes. It could be on your clothes. Who, who is promoting showering when you get home, taking your clothes off and showering and putting clean clothes on and washing those clothes and cleaning and, dis, uh, and uh, sanitizing your shoes? So you walk into your house masked up and uh, coronavirus on your clothes and on your shoes and we wonder where we get coronavirus event eventually. Well, right. they're not talking about what they're not talking about. You're not aware of what you're not aware of. It's not that this stuff is complicated. It's very simple. However, it can be complicated. We can make everything complicated by not paying attention to what we're saying, by not being in alignment with our actions, with our heart and soul, with our actions, recognizing when we're out of alignment with our heart and soul. When you're unaware that you're unaware, how, does, how do you make a decision based on all the information? People are out there making all these decisions when they're unaware that they're unaware about really important stuff. I think, honestly, it also has, it kind of comes down to, I guess, back to, I guess, politics and just, uh, again, like you said, preferences and what we see. Because, like, news sources, they aren't really going after the stuff that 
we don't notice because I guess maybe they don't even notice it themselves or maybe the people that are in charge of that don't even really, I guess, care because that's not what's interesting. You know, that's not what news is, you know, that's not what gives them. Well, Trump was um, so much of the news was about what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And so much of what he was saying was often fake news, which he was accusing everyone else of. Sure. Yeah. And and then we've got a whole bunch of people that believe that since Trump wasn't a politician and he wasn't bankrupt uh, uh, morally the way the politicians have demonstrated that they are. Well, in fact, Trump demonstrated how morally bankrupt he was throughout his entire career. People just weren't aware that they weren't aware of it. Right. And they didn't want to believe what Trump called fake news. Yeah. And he so he just propagated these lies over and over and over to where people actually believed it and believed that we needed an insurrection at the Capitol. And then we've got a bunch of senators that decided that he was uh, not going to be found guilty because they had an agenda. Didn't mean that what he did wasn't what it actually was purported to be, was encouraging craziness. Mm -hmm. now, the, the world has never been as crazy as it has gotten since Trump because the things that he has said has allowed people that were on the fringe to come out and, and think that maybe their ideas were in the mainstream. And when we've got 25 million, I mean, 75 million people voting for this guy, all, all of those 75 million people are not bad people. They are misled to a large degree, as are many Democrats. However, I, I find that Democrats are at least talking about some ideas that are about raising up the middle class from falling into the poor class and getting the poor class out of the out of the ditches. You know, even a fifteen dollar minimum wage is appalling to me. When you work a full time job and that's all you make, you you can't afford hardly to live anywhere with much of a life. Right. It, it just is not that much money. And when we've got an economic structure that causes the house that I bought in 1970, I believe, which was $21,500, to suddenly be worth close to $600,000. And my pay scale has not even gone up to half as much as that increase. I used to be able to pay my house payment with two thirds of one week's pay. Who, who do you know that can do that? That isn't wealthy. No one, you know, no. almost no. all families have to be two people. Mm -hmm. Almost all homeowners, unless you're wealthy, have to be two people to afford that payment. And well, the other thing also you got to realize is you're getting paid that $15 wage but you're also getting taxed. So it's not yeah. even $15. And, and Biden, who, who was the best that the Democrats could do somehow, there were clearly people that were more forward thinking than him, which I was in favor of, but he was the one that got the support of the country. So I voted for him, even though he was one of the, one of the people that, was pro, that promoted and got passed taxing Social Security. That's appalling to me. Mm -hmm. It should be one of the first thing he reverses now that he's got the power to do some things uh, with a wave of a pen. And I, and I hope some people start talking about that. My God, Social Security for most of us isn't enough. And when the unions are based on the corruptness of what the unions became, which was based to a large degree on the corruption that was caused by uh, the war on alcohol. When they decided that didn't work and they ended it, when they ended prohibition, that had started, it already put into business all those gangs. Well, all those gangs that were now in business that we put into business by our ignorance mm -hmm. now have an organization that wants something to do. So they go into drugs and they go into prostitution. They go into carjacks, car, carjacking and uh, stealing automobiles. They go into all kinds of corruption, which we're now faced with in the, in the war on drugs, which is a totally fake war, too. It was never a moral war. 
it's caused our prison uh, uh, population to just explode to where we have more people in prison than any other country in the world. And it's mostly black and Hispanic. And it's mostly young black and Hispanics. And, and Biden was part of that uh, get tough on crime stuff. Uh, uh, I, I imagine it was part of that uh, three, time, three strikes you're out, which was ineffective. You know, a lot of times what we did was we took somebody who was a criminal for doing drugs, made him a criminal when it was really a societal problem, an emotional problem, a mental problem. The fact that they can't make enough money to live on oftentimes. Yeah. The fact that we allow broken homes to exist the way they do. The fact that some states don't even recognize uh, child abuse as what child abuse is. You know, you can spank and beat your kid. You can, you can verbally abuse them, and it's not against the law. You know, some states have laws against it. It's not against the law for a husband to verbally abuse his wife. You know, to cause a wife to have PTSD and to kill, want to kill herself, you know, it's not against the law. <laughs> the law system is like a completely different story when you think about it. Again, with like the prison thing and going back with what you said before. Uh, um, hold on. I'm sorry. I have a, a call. Hold on. Um, but um, what you were saying about well, taxes and, you know, having a low wage you could literally go to jail for something like tax evasion and actually be kind of screwed because of that. Um, and it's all, I guess, really politics and also, I guess, what we vote for in a way. Well, we've been doing it for generation after generation. Mm -hmm. what, what the Republican platform was back in Eisenhower's days, you would think that was a Democratic platform. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, what the Democrats were doing back in the days of slavery, you would think, well, shit, that's not what Democrats do now, you know, but uh, they've re completely reversed policies, you know, and, and uh, we, you know, I, I remember back in high school, there wasn't a time that I was particularly fond of all the people running for class office. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my friends were not like those people, you know, and, a lot of times I wouldn't have wanted that, that person on my team. You know, right now, there are very few Democrats or Republicans that I would want guarding my back in a fight. Most of them are spineless. Bernie Sanders is different. However, the ignorance of Bernie Sanders to continue to call himself a Democratic Socialist, even using that word, is like poison in our society because... We have too many ignorant people that don't understand the difference between socialism and communism. They think it is one, the same road, that you become socialist and then you become communist. And a democratic socialist, most of them don't discern the difference. You know, how about become a, a golden rule pro, uh, uh, advocate? I'm an advocate of the golden rule. That's, that, yeah. that's a worthy calling. 100%. You know, and the golden rule would treat poor people like they were worth something, as opposed to doing what both parties do. You know, right now, the Democrats can't pass a $15 minimum wage because they don't have enough votes in their own Senate. I think we had 10 people that objected to the vote on the Democratic side, in addition to all the Republicans. You know, the Democrats have demonstrated repeatedly that they've got problems in the ranks. And it's, it's probably 90% of both parties are, are just horrible human beings, in my opinion. I can agree to that. It's, it's kind of crazy how we've gotten to this point now where there's, we're almost kind of so divided where it's like a 50-50. Either you support this or you don't support this. And we fight over the tiniest of things when really the people on the top are the ones that are winning because us lower people are the ones that are fighting over it, you know? And it's crazy. It really is. Well, both parties have, have been, um, to a large degree, corrupted by Citizens United. Mm -hmm. 
if if the Democrats don't get rid of get rid of that by making laws against what that allows, then we're going to be saddled with it uh, un, until they do gerrymandering. You know, it it it's important they, that they eliminate ger- gerrymandering in this country, mm-hmm. and uh, you know they should be able to make it a federal law. Uh, they they've destroyed uh, the, the so many of the the things that were done in the '60s. You know, how is it that a representative like John Lewis had such a tiny voice in this country when his message was so profoundly important to everybody that cares about people? And he died uh, holding on to a lot of the values that he held on to when he was being arrested and, and beaten and still re- maintained a, a, a generosity of kindness uh, uh, and, and empathy towards people that, that's remarkable. And, and how is he not immortalized in a way uh, that would d- d- extinguish somebody like Trump even, ever having a, a, a chance? You know, there, there was a point when Trump was first running where the Republicans thought it was a joke because he was so unworthy of the position. And suddenly they're ass-kissing ass everything he does, you know? When the when the Tea Party came into being, and we had assholes like Rush Limbaugh and and Sean Hannity and and uh, uh, Mark Levine and and um, uh, who's who's that other guy? You know, he realized that he was part of the destruction of America when he was supporting all these super right wing Tea Party views. Glenn Beck, you know, and and he, here they all are supporting Trump. Saying that it's 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 a hoax. It's not it's not a, a terrible virus. It's no more than the flu or the cold, you know, and convincing people that are ignorant enough to believe them that it's crazy to wear a mask. I I, I ask anybody who believes that way: if I have corona ma- coronavirus and I'm infectious, would you rather me have a mask on when I'm about to spit on you, or not? Would you want a social distance or? or double that or double that and wear a mask. If I was about to spit on you, you'd have to be stupid not to want to wear a mask. Yeah. And that's what we have, Texas and Mississippi, you know, uh, in Tennessee, you know, they're opening up places when, when we still got a, a, you know, half the country is, is still susceptible. Over half of the country is still susceptible. And even with the coronavirus vaccines that we have right now, They've proven that they're not very effective against the African version and sometimes even the British version. And that that means even if you've gotten both shots. So would you rather be wearing a mask and have me wear a mask if I'm about to cough or spit? (laughs) Well, I always hear uh, a few of the arguments. One of the main one was always like, you know, the percentages are always low. But, like, that's also kind of because of the people that are wearing the masks, you know. It kind of shows how effective it is. It, it, it is because of whatever is causing it to be the way it is. We don't know all the answers. But an intelligent person knows that if I'm about to spit on you, you'd rather have a mask on me. Exactly. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter about all the statistics that we've heard mm-hmm. and lies that have been told on both sides. If someone is sick with this virus... And I can tell you, because I had it, that it is nothing anybody wants. And to, and to hold out and to act like it's an invasion of your privacy, your rights to freedom, to cause you to have to right. stay inside if you don't have to be out, which is just a sensible thing, and to wear a mask if you are out. And if you've got a family member that's sick, man, keep him in the other room. Get a damn HEPA filter filter so you're filtering your air all the time because, mm-hmm. you know, if, 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 if they're down here by the, the intake vent for your air conditioning, then that virus is going throughout the house. And if I go out into public and I'm unaware that I'm unaware that my feet are picking up coronavirus, wherever it could be, because that's where it falls. Mm. That's the way gravity works. You know, and if you're too stupid to understand that, well, you're too stupid to be in charge of my kids anywhere. You're too stupid to be a teacher. Too stupid to be one of my representatives in government. 
You know, they don't give these people a, 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 an IQ test, a suitability test. You know, Trump would fail practically every sense of honor there is as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned. The things I've read and watched about people that he's taken advantage of, it's no different than the American people, really. He has lied to us and lied to us and lied to us. You know, and that, and that for me, that means I don't care if he's got any good ideas. Get him, the, get him away from anybody that he can influence. I don't want him being uh, part of what my son looks up to or my daughter. You know, the fact that he, he uh, acknowledges that he, he talks about grabbing women by the pussy, and grabbing their tits, whether they wanted it or not, or kissing them, whether they wanted it or not. And then he's got like, how many of them have sued him over this shit? You know? He's a despicable human being. He really is, yeah. Anybody that is a, 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 an evangelist or a religious person has violated an unspoken oath to follow in the footsteps of Christ. Now, I don't. I don't say that to all my religious friends, you know. But you know, everyone has their right to believe what they believe, and sometimes I would rather be able to have a conversation with somebody who could not hear the truth about some of that stuff, you mm -hmm. know. I chose not to have an argument with, with with my son the other day when he was saying he agrees with the guy in charge of Texas opening up because businesses need to open up. Well, how about this virus wouldn't have killed 500,000 people in America had our president not called it a hoax and spent the rest of his time in power not supporting the best ideas about getting rid of this virus, not following what Japan and what South Korea and what New Zealand and Australia and so many other countries did to get the, to get the rate down to zero when it was flourishing around the world. Our president was an ignoramus. Yeah. And most of our representatives are spineless. They're spineless. And it's a shame. That's kind of just how society is now. You know, li listen to any of these people speak and listen to how often they say but after they say something. Listen how often it happens. Just ruling out what they just said that was good over and over and over and over. And then telling us some whatever. We've been being indoctrinated by both sides as long as you've been alive, as long as your parents have been alive, as long as your grandparents have been alive. We've been being indoctrinated by people in charge, you know, and following a, a, a path of one or two choices that we wound up with no matter how stupid it was. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's a lot to take in. But when you really start to think about it, it and and it does a lot. <laughs> we use but so unconsciously. We mm -hmm. use I have to, I must, I need to, I mm -hmm. got to so unconsciously. And it's dictating where our path is going. It really changes your whole perspective. Yeah. So awareness is the great gift. Yeah. And and now that you're aware, it's important to become aware of how you're still not aware. So you can do something about it because otherwise you've got no choice. Mm -hmm. There's always room. All, all, all your choices are based in the fiction that you've been saying and, and causing your perception to be. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying just you, but everybody. Including yeah, I understand that though. But I, I wanted to say, um, yeah, we, we've been doing this. I, uh, I don't usually have my, uh, uh, usually it's around an hour. I try not to keep it like extremely long. But um, thank you for doing this. This was really interesting. This was really enlightening for me as well, actually. Well, and we were barely talking about music. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we barely started, and then a whole different tangent just completely changed it. But, you know, I, I like that. I honestly, I like when the podcast isn't so specific to one thing, and it can continue into a completely different conversation. I, I was doing an interview with a uh, 
British magazine and, and uh, prior to the video, the, the interview, mm-hmm. we got into the subject matter. We talked for two hours and she was crying, mm-hmm. you know, she was suffering from cancer. Wow. And in our speaking, when we're causing the possibility of cancer getting worse, as opposed to the healing of, from cancer, mm-hmm. that's pretty important. And so we did the interview. We wound up doing enough of an inter- interview that they included it in two magazines. Wow. We didn't talk about any of this other stuff during the official interview. Yeah. But I saw that they came out with another Eddie special mm-hmm. and had another complete interview with all stuff we hadn't talked about in the first interview. That's really cool that they can s- separate it from, you know, the musical aspect and then more of the. Well, you, you're welcome at some point to, to uh, com- complete uh, an interview. I, I mean, if I just spent time talking about the Flying Burrito Brothers, we could take the full hour. Definitely. Yeah. When you really go over the whole analysis of what happened. If I just talked about producing Adrian Legg's uh, award winning albums, mm-hmm. take an hour. I think we should definitely chat again, definitely have another uh, section where we do this, another segment. I think it would really be exciting. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I really enjoyed this. It was great. And uh, it was a three-hour segment, and I was supposed to do an hour. Well, mm-hmm. we did a full three-hour segment, wow. and another DJ was in the room. He says, I need to have you on my on my segment, too. So yeah. Do- Primity. There's so much good stuff to talk about, you know. I did an interview one time about surf guitar and sounds. Hmm. You know, they wanted to have me back just alone. I was with three other people mm-hmm. uh, doing a interview about surf guitar and the sounds and stuff, you know. And mm-hmm. he wanted me back, which we haven't done, you know, to just talk about surf guitar and the sounds. Because I, at 15, I was helping Fender develop the sounds that were being used in, in music, you know. Uh, when I when I was uh, first starting out, surf guitar was all the rage, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I have a lot of experience in that world and the country world, the rock world, the rockabilly world, the blues world. You know, Eddie was, uh, it's been rumored that Billy B.B. King said that Eddie was the best white blues guitar player of his era. That's mm-hmm. a great compliment from one of my favorite guitar players. Yeah. I was honored to get to spend... Uh, quite a bit of time with him and uh, with BB and uh, Mike Bloomfield when I was about 16. I don't remember where I was, but I got backstage and sat with them and we were discussing vibrato and I was developing my vibrato at the time. Mm -hmm. Two of my idols right in front of me as as close as you are to this camera, you know, (laughs) that's crazy. I can imagine. Yeah. Well, anyway, I appreciate the calling and and, uh, doing the interview and, uh, I hope you uh, edit it so that it's powerful. Well, honestly, sometimes I I want to edit it, but there's so much that I want to keep in, you know. Yeah. So and very very little editing. I I sometimes barely do like five or ten minutes out of like a few hours of you know content. Yeah. Or even with this one, it's an hour and twenty minutes. I think we've been doing this, and who knows how much I'm even considering actually taking out, you know. But, yeah, I, I really appreciate this. This was great. Well, thank you. All right. Well, <laughs> I won't keep you any longer. All right. Good luck. All right. Bye. Well, um, that was my interview with uh, Bobby Cochran. Uh, that was really great. That was, that was eye-opening. Um, but um, thank you all for watching. Uh, like, subscribe, follow, whatever you want to say. Um, And yeah, I guess that's about it. Peace.